So I want to take you back to a song you wrote and performed a long time ago, Time of Your Song. You like that? I like it. You're right here now. Okay. Wow, it's loud. Maybe bring them down just a little bit. <laughs> Keep me up, though. <laughs> so um, in Time of Your Song, you're asking questions. You're, you're imagining a 13-year-old asking questions to a present-day me. Now, I'm not sure I understand fully the lyrics of the song, but um, I'm wondering if you've had a chance in the years since that song came out, given the transformations of your life, to imagine that scene over again. If you had a 13-year-old you right now, what would you say? Uh, well, you know, I think there's a song I wrote called Confidence on the last record, Ayaka. Kata, sorry. And um, that song, when I sing that song every, every day, I feel like I'm singing to myself, or a younger version of myself, to be confident, you know? Because someone, if you don't fit into the normal, into the normal um, flow of things, someone who's, you know, on the outside a little bit, you spend a lot of your life trying to be like everybody else. And I would have told myself at that age, you know, you're different, it's okay, and embrace it. How would you, how would you, how do you think you were different, you know, at that age? Um, it's hard for me to say specifically. I'm just a different type of being, I'm a different type of creature than most. And um, I didn't believe that for a long time. I believe like, okay, I can fit into this, per this box or that box or that one. And uh, then eventually I came to terms with the understanding that I'm actually, I actually to be happy need to sort of be doing my own thing in the way that makes sense to me. So I know that your, you know, your music has so many different uh, styles to it. Um, you, you've got your reggae style, you, you do beatboxing, um, there's some rap in there. Um, some of your stuff could be called rock. We could call one day pop, possibly. Um, and I heard you, you know, you, I heard you in an interview on a, on a reggae interview being asked about uh, reggae and kind of, you know, reluctantly telling the, the interviewer that you're not pure reggae or that reggae was, or pure reggae was an earlier phase or something like that. Um, and it sort of reminded me a little bit of, of where you've been religiously. So, so how, does, how does the religious component of who you are interact with the artistic component of who you are? Oh, well, I like this idea that I had recently, which um, I was speaking about in an interview. It's not something I really thought about, but as I was speaking about it, it kind of made, made sense to me. That in the beginning, when I, when I first came and broke into the into the m mainstream pop music world, things for me were very black and white and was represented even down to the way that I dress in black and white. You know, it was one, there was really one path and <clears throat> the idea was that if you work hard enough in that path, you know, you'll come to some kind of spiritual enlightenment or connection with God. And, um, and I believe, I give myself wholeheartedly over to that thinking, that path, and doing things outside of my own reason, my own logic, what things that didn't make sense to me. But, um, and then the music, the first record that I made, really not on my own accord, but because the producer knew that I made reggae music, that I was, that I loved reggae and that I did reggae, he wanted to make like a Roots reggae album. Okay. He was like, make it by the rules, you know, like a real Roots, true to the original style. So that's what I did, and it was life for me. What was very much I was two things, even though I felt that maybe there was more to me than just that. That was pretty much what it was: black and white, you know, Hasidic guy doing reggae, and my thinking was that way, and I tried to sort of fit in that way. But very soon, I would say by 2006, seven, my beard started going gray. I think this is a deep Kabbalistic thing that happened, basically. <laughs> and during that time is when I started studying outside of just the Chabad canon of, of ideas. I started studying Nachman and different Hasidists. I started opening up a little bit to the idea of other possibilities, other dimensions, other ways of, of living or thinking. And it was all still within the Hasidic you know, ideology or Jewish thinking, but... Um, it started to open up and I literally started to go gray, you know, at like 25, 26 years old. And by the time it's 2009 or 10, my whole beard was white, basically gray. So I think at some point I went from this way of being of black and white thinking and, and being 
one way or another or being two, just two things to this sort of mishmash of a lot of different things. And my way of seeing the world also became much more gray in the sense that I, I began to not see things so one way or the other, but actually as a mixture of, of, of everything. So this is the difference between a fan and what I call the mixed multitude. You know, when the Jews left Egypt, they had the, what they called the mixed multitude. It was like the non-Jews who were like, oh, they're leaving. Let's get the hell out of here also. <laughs> and and I, have, I have fans that I refer to as the mixed multitude. You know, they, they just jump on the train when the train is going in a direction or whatever. And those are usually the loudest, most obnoxious fans that are screaming for songs or whatever when I'm in the middle of, like, deep spiritual expression of my soul. And they're like, sunshine, why won't he play sunshine one day? I wrote, that's the mixed multitude. But then there are fans like yourself who didn't never even saw an image of me. You heard the music and it right away resonated with your soul. And those are the people that are still fans today that allow me to still be able to make music. So thank you. Yeah. I'm curious, you recently tweeted um, that you're looking forward to a new stage where it's just about creating music, right? Yeah. I won't quote the tweet because it's, uh, it's not PG rated, but okay. um, is that a statement about your relationship with Judaism in any way? Not so much. This is more about my relationship now with music and with my fans um, because I've already been through everything and back with the Jews. <laughs> you know. I came out, I feel like with Spain last summer, like the BDS really helped me out in that sense. They really gave me a little bit of a, a jump start. They made the Jews love me again, pretty much, when they, when they saw those videos of me singing Jerusalem in front of Palestinian flags. All the Jews were like, ah, oh, he's not so bad. I feel like Justin Bieber kind of in that, um, that way, like, they love you again, they love me again. But um, the music now, the, what, my point in that, comment that what I'm trying to say is that you know now it's like 10 years there's a lot of fans for different reasons a lot of different types of fans my music never just spoke to one person it's a cross genre thing it's a mix it's a it's all about blending so if the fans are from all different places different types of people and I just came to a place like within myself musically where I just you know I've cultivated and put together an incredible band which sometimes people don't realize the importance of that, you know, they think of the singer, you know, or whatever, the artist, but the, when you're just playing the songs and you have a band that's just playing parts and they're just playing what's on the record and they're doing the same thing every night, so yeah, it doesn't matter who your band is, but when you approach music in a different way, which is how I approach it, as its own living, breathing organism, and each show, each night is its own, like, clean slate, it's like a microcosm of of, of my life and the world and everything happening on this stage, none of it is bullshit, it's all real. And none of it is faked and, and it's always about, for me, trying to, trying to go into a new direction, to find a new, you know, a new path. So the music reflects that. And not everyone understands that. And not even like at concerts, not people that buy the, the songs, the records. Some people get it, they love it, and others don't. So, I'm trying right now to sort of cultivate my audience and say, okay, great, if you want to buy records, buy records. But if you want to come to a show, this is what you should expect. Don't ever expect me to do anything because that's what I'm supposed to do. I might play an encore, I might not. I might play a hit song, I might not. I might play a hit song in a completely different key. But I want people at the shows who really are up for that, are up for something new, something different, and are not afraid. So it sounds like commercial viability is less important than creativity. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I can write hit songs, and I enjoy writing hit songs like Sunshine or One Day. Um, that's fun. I like to do that, and I'll still do that, and I'll always do that. But when it comes to the live performance, that's my main focus right now. That's where I find myself. Most of my time is spent on the road doing shows with the band. And... Um, you know, that's where, that's where it happens every night, so that's where my, my focus is at. Yeah. Hello, my name is Rabbi Dov Hillel Klein. I am the Chabad rabbi servicing the students here at Northwestern. We're so happy that you're here. Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. <laughs> um, my quick question 
is that uh, I'm sure you're aware that your music really transforms so many people. And, you know, I lead a lot of birthright trips. I've done 34 birthright trips to Israel. And whenever we play your music on the bus, the whole bus turns into like a, a, a rock and roll place or a reggae place or whatever. <laughs> but the point, my question is, is what to, and you started mentioning it. What is your relationship today with Israel? How do you feel Israel in your life? And what gave you the strength to stand up against the BDS movement? Well, the, the BDS situation was just acting on instinct. I didn't have to do much. Um, you know, I'm not the, the one to be coerced into making any statements. He'll tell you, you know, we've been through it today a little bit. <laughs> I love this guy. He went through a lot with me. But, um, you know, I, I like things to happen organically. I like things to happen naturally. I don't ever like to be told what to do. And, you know, they just, you know, I didn't have to do much. It was like, you want me to say what? No, I won't do that. You want, you want me not to play the show? Okay, pay me. You know, I mean, either way, I'm getting paid. I'll take the three days off. <laughs> I mean, I was on the e I was on the e We were in Eastern Europe. We had to fly to Spain for this one show. We were excited when when the show was canceled. We didn't have to fly, and we're still getting paid. So basically, you know, then they start putting pressure, you know, and then I'm like, these guys are crazy. And then, um, you know, then everything happened, and I didn't even mention it. it was someone, they mentioned it in a press release. It wasn't even like I took what happened and twisted my, my uh, perspective on it and then put it out. They, they with the press release, they put it out. Next thing I know is like, you know, this relates to your Israeli question, but Israelis, lots of them, I mean, Jews all over, but Israelis in particular are like, thank you, Madis Yahweh, for standing up for our country. For, this is what we go through. This is what our artists go through, our musicians that travel abroad. This is what they have to deal with. And now it's being done to me, and I was, it was almost like lucky, you know, that, you know, okay, cool, so now the rest of the world, you know, especially like American Jews, like myself included, are going to realize that this is what Israelis have to go through. And, um, you know, there's always been a difference between American Jews, Israelis, there's a cultural difference, there's, there's always the connection, there's the love, but there's a difference. And my music, I, I always felt it didn't really connect over there. People would always say, you must be huge in Israel, you know, and, uh, you know, my songs did okay, people know of me, but they don't feel such a strong connection. But after this happened, and then I went back and played, you know, because that's... People would say, like, oh, why would you go back, this and that. So as long as I was f safe, I felt protected, then the whole point, you know, is to make music, to, to do it, you know, not to not to not do it. So so I went back and then had the experience, you know, and people saw the, the videos, and it was an intense experience for me. But it never qu I never questioned it once, and I never for one second the question. And... Um, then basically uh, now I feel like the last time I went back to Israel, Israelis actually, they like really, they like me now, you know, they're really like, yeah, you really stood up for us, you know, you really did something, you know, not just like American Jewish kid like singing songs in Hebrew a little bit. <clears throat> so on, 